Welcome to another Advanced Manufacturing Media webinar. Our presentation today is Capabilities and Advancements in, Manu in Water Jet Technology, sponsored by Flow International. Hello, I'm Patrick Worsniak, Senior Editor at Manufacturing Engineering. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to provide some background on what we will be doing today. Our sponsor today is Flow International Corporation. Flow manufactures high-precision water jet machining systems that are capable of cutting a wide range of materials from metals, stone, glass, composites, and ceramics in a cold cutting process that leaves no heat-affected zone on the workpiece material. Learn more at www.flow.com. Manufacturers today are constantly faced with pr improving productivity and the cutting of exotic alloys, composites, layered and super hard materials is not a novelty anymore with water jet machining technologies. New water jets feature pump pressures that have increased by 50% and solid model CAD CAM software has simplified a once daunting task of programming bevels and 3D patterns enabling greatly improved uptime with equipment advances and in-shop service support. The first person we will hear from is presenter Chip Burnham, Vice President at Flow. Chip has created, engineered, and marketed water jet machining technology since 1985. Chip's presentation has been pre-recorded, and after it concludes, questions will be answered live by Jeff Bailey, Application Support Manager at Flow, and Matt Simpson, Flow Applications and Training Specialist. You will be able to ask questions using the Q&A box that appears on the right side of your screen. Time permitting, your questions will be answered following the presentation. If time runs out before we can get to all of the questions, we will make sure that the answers are emailed to you. The um, website for Flow uh, is actually flowwaterjet.com now. Apologize for that. Um, now, for a few housekeeping notes, this presentation today will contain videos, and often, as often happens when viewing videos over the internet, the quality of the presentation can be affected by the type of internet connection you have, the amount of total bandwidth available to you, and the number of people accessing that, that bandwidth at the time. If you experience difficulty, please let us know by way of the Q&A box. If you have any questions about our, any other aspects of our webinars, please email me at pworsniak at sme.org. I'll rejoin you after the presentation with a few concluding remarks. Now, here's Chip Burnham of Flow International. Hello, everyone. We are very pleased that you could join us for this WaterJet webinar. We really appreciate you taking some time from your, ta from your day to join us. My name is Chip Burnham, and I've been working with Flow WaterJets since 1985. At the end of this presentation, there's going to be an opportunity for you to ask questions of our senior applications engineers, and they'd be able to handle the most basic to the most advanced questions. So welcome you to ask some questions at that time. First, a little bit of WaterJet background. It is one of the fastest growing major machine tool processes of the past 15 years. It's regarded as the most versatile. The pure WaterJet has been around since the 70s, and the abrasive WaterJet was invented by Flow in 79 and commercialized in 84. The abrasive WaterJet is the most common usage of ultra-high pressure water in the world today. In this WaterJet seminar, we're going to cover three topics an overview of the technology, the latest advancements, and then a comparison to other technologies. And I'm hoping at the end of this discussion that you'll have a pretty good understanding of how a water jet might be uh, added to your shop properly. Here is an entire water jet system. The ultra high pressure system in item one is comprised of the pump, the high pressure plumbing, and then the cutting head. Item two is the control system for controlling uh, running a program and then item three would be the ma machine tool itself with the material support catcher tank. There are two types of water jets the pure water jet and the abrasive water jet. With the pure water jet high pressure water is uh, turned into a supersonic stream 
that is as thin as a human hair, five thousandths of an inch. By the way, I, I'm not going to be using metric units in this. Uh, most of the attendees are from the states, and it avoids me having to jump between units. So I apologize for those of you who are more comfortable with metric units. The abrasive water jet then starts out as a pure water jet, and we add the abrasive in. Um, uh, then they exit out together to form an abrasive water jet stream. That stream is, is larger in diameter. It's 30 thousandths of an inch. The pure water jet and the abrasive water jet cut different things. The pure water jet cuts soft materials, basically materials that could be cut with a knife. And the abrasive water jet cuts hard materials, any metal, ceramic, stone, glass, composite. And it, it actually can cut over 10 inches thick through any of these materials. It only takes about two minutes on a flow machine to switch from pure water jet to abrasive water jet. And that is, is great because it even more uh, expands the versatility of this already versatile process. The water jet pump is the heart of the system. The original pump used in water jet and still used today is the intensifier pump. And you can see here there's a 60,000 PSI rated intensifier and there's a 94,000 PSI rated hyperjet pump. The other approach to generating ultra high pressure water is to use a direct drive approach. And here we have the 55,000 PSI Hyplex. Let me describe how both of these systems work and hopefully you'll get an understanding. Now I'm not going to do a whole lot of comparisons between the two, but I will tell you this, that both Hyplex and intensifiers are viable ways to create reliable water pressure to be used in your shop. They have pros and cons between each of them, and if you'd like to learn more about those pros and cons, then I suggest you check out the WaterJet blog, and there you can see a discussion in, in, a, in a little bit more detail. But it would take up a lot of this seminar to try to go through the pros and cons for different applications and such. But let me at least explain to you how they A water jet pump creates water pressure through the intensification principle or direct drive, and let's start with intensifier. Here you see a cutaway of the intensifier, and in the green is a biscuit with two high-pressure plungers. If this biscuit is moving to the right, then low-pressure water is coming in on the left side, while high-pressure water is coming in on the right side. Hydraulic oil is pushing this biscuit to the right, and when it reaches the end, hydraulic oil will then push it to the left. The way that the intensifier works is you take 3,000 PSI oil pressure, and you push it against that large biscuit, the biscuit area is 20 times larger than the end of the plunger where the water is. So 3,000 PSI hydraulic oil pressure times 20 delivers 60,000 PSI water pressure. And that's how we generate the ultra high pressure water with an intensifier pump. The direct drive also reliably generates uh, high pressure water and it does so in a slightly different uh, fashion. Much like your automobile or a pressure washer that you might use at low pressure to wash off your house before you paint it, it uses a triplex pump with a crankcase. And here you have three pistons that are moving uh, back and forth. The, uh, the motor rotates the crank. The crank is then moving the pistons back and forth. And on the back stroke, the low pressure water comes in. And on the forward stroke, the high pressure water goes out. And there are three cylinders working together, delivering high pressure water at di different intervals. Um, so uh, there, you can see that, that on the right, the direct drive does not have hydraulic oil. There's no hydraulic loop, and it just takes the, the power right off the electric motor. It also strokes much, much faster. And that's one of the reasons why the intensifier can go to much higher pressure than the direct drive can. Let's take a journey of a drop of water. First, you pressurize the water in either the intensifier or in the direct drive pump. In this case, you can see the intensifier. We then put the water through a tiny jewel orifice. The water then exits in su at a supersonic speed. You see what I uh, mentioned there in the notes. It says the pressure is converted to velocity, and that's true. We don't cut with any pressure at all in the stream. We convert all that pressure to velocity when the water passes through a tiny jewel orifice. And that's the, uh, that orifice is either diamond, sapphire, or ruby. At that point, we've made the pure water jet. And only after we've made the water jet do we add the abrasive. We don't pump abrasive through the pump. We add the abrasive to the water jet stream after it's been created. And then uh, with that, you see that we end up with a, a mixture of water and abrasive and a little bit of air. 
and that creates the abrasive water jet stream. So where are they used today? You can see end markets from aerospace all the way to marine and many different applications within them. Now I'm not going to go through each bullet here, but you get the idea that there are this many and many more applications in, in all these end markets. For example, under aerospace, composite wings, spars, and struts, all of the big wings, tail section are, that are used in the Boeing and Airbus commercial aircraft, um, for those composite winged aircraft, they are trimmed with Flo's abrasive water jets. The carpet in your automobile was very likely trimmed with pure water being moved around by a pedestal robot. Food processing, uh, because it's a water jet stream that's very thin, it doesn't use up a lot of food when it, when it cuts something, and it doesn't transfer bacteria from one food product area to another. In housing, stone countertops and, and ornate inlays are cut with a, a abrasive water jet. And in this case um, of the ornate inlays, if you go into a, a hotel or a large company and you see a beautiful stone inlay in the floor that has a lot of uh, intricate patterns, it is very, very likely that was cut with an abrasive water jet. If you see an inlay that is just squares and rectangles and triangles, that's very likely to be, have been cut with a saw. So I'm not going to get into all the details here, but you get the idea that the water jet is widely used, and these are some of the end markets and applications. Versatility is our biggest asset. The, the abrasive water jet is extremely versatile. It's a cold cutting process, very simple to operate, and it's affordable. Um, with the, regarding the versatility, we can cut over 10 inches thick through basically any material and get, get tolerances down to two, even one thousandths of an inch. It's a cold cutting process. There's no heat affected zone, no stresses, and it provides the best edge. I'll get into the edge a little bit more in a moment. Um, simple operation. The abrasive water jet is used with the same parameter setup for virtually everything that you cut. Like a chainsaw that you use the same saw and you, and you pull the trigger all the way, whether you're cutting oak or you're cutting pine and whether you're cutting the tree down or you're cutting a limb. Uh, it doesn't matter how thick or thin the area is and it doesn't matter what kind of wood it is, you're going to run the chainsaw the same way. Well, the supersonic erosion process of the abrasive water jet is, is kind of similar to that. You run the same parameters with everything that you cut, thin, thick, titanium, glass, stone, composites, doesn't matter. You only vary the uh, cutting speed going through these different materials. That is a huge attribute of the abrasive jet. And as promised, I want to talk a little bit more about the edge. The water jet makes the best edge. First of all, it's a cold cutting process. There's no heat or stress imparted in, into the material. It, and it provides a satin smooth edge and the kerf diameter that we cut is very, very thin. So in the end, you're going to have a material that you have not imparted any heat or stress into. You haven't warped it. Now you can relieve stress. You can relieve uh, stress and in, in the part can warp, but you're not going to put any into it. And that the fact that it's a satin smooth edge um, is another attribute. We get down to about a 125 RA surface finish. And at those levels, our customers find that those parts can typically be used as is. But if you need to get down to a mirrored surface or something like that, beyond what the abrasive water jet can produce, you would just kiss it off with a mill, taking off a couple of thou because of the, um, we have not imparted any heat or stress. You can just remove very little material and get it to the finish you need. However, most of our customers take parts off the machine and use them as is. And the fact that the kerf is so minimal means that you can create incredible detail even when cutting something very, very thick. So let's talk about the latest advancements. We've covered some of the, the fundamental technologies of water jet, how the pumps work, the, how the cutting heads work, the different applications that are and end markets that, that they're employed in. And let's touch upon the, the latest advancements. First of all, hyperpressure. As pressure goes up, so does cut speed. Most of the water jets today operate at this 50 to 60,000 PSI. And since 2004, Flows provided the highest pressure rated pumps at 94,000 PSI. It's actually our most popular now. Um, it's really been taking off since 2006. But uh, anyway, it, this is kind of intuitive. You take the pressure up, you cut faster. If you look on the left, you can see the original intensifiers from 1972 and then the hyperpressure on the right. They look different and the same. They're kind of overall the same shape, 
And since you saw the cross section of how an intensifier works, you can understand that there's a reciprocating uh, biscuit and two plungers in there going back and forth. But the technologies of today are very, very much more advanced. Bottom line is it's all about jet speed. As I explained during the cutting head description, we don't actually have a, a high pressure stream. We have a supersonic stream. We convert the pressure to velocity. So the key is take the pressure up so that you get the jet speed up. We want to have uh, higher jet speed so that we can increase the cutting speed and use less abrasive. More on the abrasive in just a moment. So the hyperpressure advancement can be seen here as you go from 40 to 60 to 90,000 psi. At the very bottom you see the abrasive um, uh, vials and you see that at 40k, 60k, 90k a gradual decrease in the amount of abrasive that's being used. And then the second row there you have the power density. Your power density goes way up of course because you're putting more power through a smaller area you have a, a greater power density. Um, overall you get the the fundamental idea here that as you go up in pressure the system gets more efficient. So let's compare hyperpressure, a pump rated at 94,000 psi, to a standard water jet pump rated at 60,000 psi. I've got three quick comparisons to help illustrate this a little bit. First of all, if you hold the cutting head parameters the same, you take the pressure up, your cut speed goes up. And with that, you get greater throughput and lower cost per part. But what if we hold the power the same? Well, if you hold the horsepower the same, then the cut speed will go up just a little bit, but the abrasive usage, as you saw in the last page, the last slide, the abrasive usage is dr dr drastically reduced. This reduces your cost per part. Abrasive is 50% of the machine operating cost. So that means that uh, I'm excluding labor, I'm excluding the, the depreciation on the machine. I'm talking about what does it cost you to run that machine for an hour? Half of the cost of running the machine for an hour is going to be in the abrasive. So cutting that in half is of huge advantage. With horsepower held constant in our third example, a single head hyperpressure outperforms a standard dual head machine. And this outperforms it in a number of ways. It has simpler op operation and there's no need to keep the heads identical and it has better material utilization. So let me explain a little bit more about this example. It's very common for someone to look at a high production water jet machine and say, I want to use 100 horsepower. Well, you can't actually put all the power through one 60,000 PSI head. You, 100 horsepower becomes very inefficient at that pressure level. So you, you, to use 100 horsepower at 60K, you've got to break up the head into two. So you have two heads running 50 horsepower each. You compare that to hyperpressure where you can in fact put all the pressure through one head very efficiently using all 100 horsepower with a 94,000 PSI rated pump putting that, that uh, power through one head. In that case you will have huge advantages over running a 60k dual head. You're basically going to have out, uh, outperform the single head in a number of ways. Any operator knows that it is a pain in the neck to try to keep a dual head machine cutting with both heads cutting exactly the same. Invariably, whether it is a water jet or a milling machine or a router or whatever, one of the heads is cutting slightly different than the other. So if you can avoid this situation, you want to do so, especially when you get to high tolerance work that a lot of the flow machines are used for. Secondarily, you get better machine utilization, material utilization, not machine, excuse me. You get better material utilization. When you're running dual head, you basically take a, a sheet of material, let's say it's a 4 by 8 or a 5 by 10 foot sh sheet or plate of material, and you put a line down the middle and the head, uh, one head cuts on the left side, one head cuts on the right side, and if your parts you're, you're cutting don't happen to mathematically line up very well, you can have a lot of waste material down the middle of where the, the two work zones are. You often will see that people have sophisticated softwares that they need to employ to shut off one of the heads and try to squeeze extra parts down in that gap down the middle. When you have a single head machine, it is so much easier on the programmer and on the operator to cut odd or even number of parts, to use up the whole material, to not worry about if the two heads are cutting in the same fashion, they just uh, set up the machine, take care of their one head, and begin cutting. 
I hope that that makes sense. I think the best way to encapsulate all the benefits of hyperpressures is just to take you down 10 quick facts. Hyperpressure is 75K. Standard water jet pumps out there are 40 to 75. They're really running about 50 to 60K. And our hyperjet runs at 94,000 PSI rating. Velocity matters. 500 miles per hour faster stream with hyperpressure than at, with a standard pump. The pressures from all water jet suppliers have always gone up and never down. Everyone knows that the going up in pressure is more efficient. Flow has always been the leader in taking the pressure up. And every time that we have, we've heard that it wasn't necessary until the day comes when, when the other water jet manufacturers are able to advance their technologies to approximate our pressures and performance. And then, of course, it's very important to have that pressure. So just know that water jet uh, pressures have always gone up. They will continue to go up. There is more pressure increases to come. Flow customers have made the hyperpressure pump, the hyperjet, the largest selling pump in the world. They're actually very fast and easy to maintain, even more so than our 60K pumps or the Hyplex pumps. They're on a 500 hour preventative maintenance cycle. The Hyperjet uses 30 to 50% less abrasive. And that is something that we've talked about a couple times uh, before. Abrasive is half the cost of running an abrasive water jet machine tool. Hyperjets can be operated at 60K, but a standard water jet pump cannot be operated at hyperpressure pressure levels. The pumps won't do it, they're designed not to do it, and the manufacturers make sure of that because it wouldn't be safe. It's the same for flow. Our 60K pumps cannot be operated above 60K, period. And the 94K hyperjet can't be operated above 94K. They're designed not to do that. So the benefit is with a hyperjet, if you do have a, uh, an application where you might want to come down in pressure and cut, you can do that. Hyperjets can cut just as thick as standard uh, pressure pumps, over 10 inches. The stream diameter for equal horsepower is 25 to 35% smaller. This allows a hyperjet pump to, to generate even greater detail than the standard pumps do. And lastly, hyperjets work well on pure water jet applications too, especially when the pure water jet is having trouble cutting a material. The hyperjet has a far higher energy density and can often rip through the material that a 60K pump struggles with. So I hope that that helps you with the overall um, understanding of what hyperpressure is and what it does for us. I'd like to now move to the, the next advancement, which is involving the controls. All machine tool suppliers know that it's very important to uh, maximize the performance of the programming and the operation of their machine tool to make it more productive to make it easier to use um, and that this is all very important. So let's take you uh, through a little bit about what's happened in water. First of all in the mid 90s Flow led the machine tool industry as a whole with PC Windows based intelligent controls. That was Flowmaster. And what happened was we went from lookup tables and a lot of uh, tribal knowledge on how to cut something with a water jet to the time where the programmer or the operator simply enters the material type the thickness, the quality, and then of course the pattern. The machine knows how to start and stop the jet, slow down at corners, speed up on straights, and if you have a, a machine equipped so, it can even angle the head over to eliminate the edge taper and corner washout. So basically it was an intelligent control that took a lot of the guesswork and all the trial and error out of the, the hands of the programmer and the operator. So to understand these controls a little bit, I think you first need to understand the errors that occur on a, a water jet cut part. And these errors are, are known as stream lag and taper. Stream lag is when you're moving in, the, in this example to the right, you can see the little swish lines suggesting that the stream at the exit point is lagging behind. The slower you go, the more you can minimize that. The faster you go, the greater the stream lags. On the image to the right there, you can see corner damage on the bottom of the part, that part's been flipped over, is due to that stream lag. So you can imagine the top of the part looks perfect. On a water jet part, you always want to flip it over and look at the back side to see how it looks. And if the back side looks as good as the front side, then that was cut with, with a Flowmaster controlled intelligent uh, control system. The other aspect here is the V-shaped taper. The faster you go, the greater you have V-shaped taper. And the slower you go, you can minimize it, but you can't get rid of it completely. And that's the other error that you see uh, on water jet cut parts. So, first of all, 
Flowmaster was brought uh, brought in in the mid 90s in order to compensate for that stream lag and to make the system much much easier to run where you, again you just enter the material type thickness and quality level but then in 2001 flow uh, invented and released the dynamic water jet and what that does is it took care of the taper problem and it so like this basically it automatically in a behind the scenes operation where your operator or programmer doesn't have to do this it does it by itself you just program the flat pattern and the dynamic water jet automatically tilts the head to one side and pushing all the v-shaped taper to the scrap side of the kerf so it doesn't eliminate the taper it moves it it's ideal for flat plate and the intelligent controls with dynamic water jet improve the accuracy in slashed part cycle time Accuracies are now possible on an abrasive water jet down to a thou. Most cutting is really at that two to four thou, but a good operator can get it all the way down to a thousandth of an inch, plus or minus thou, for finished part tolerance. And the cycle time of cutting a part is two to four times faster with dynamic than with a conventional abrasive water jet that does not have such a dynamic uh, water jet tilt control. So then the next thing was, what about taking it to the next level? Originally, with 2D, our customers were cutting 2D parts, and they were constantly pushed to lower production costs and increase quality. And that was the driver of the development of dynamic water jet, powered by the Flowmaster control. So that's the 2D parts. That's just basically get me better part quality and uh, get, it, get them faster. The next most common is to perform bevel cutting. And, and lastly is 3D. So you can kind of imagine that most of the customers out there want to cut 2D parts faster and better, better quality and more quickly. And then comes bevel cutting for weld prep or other types of uh, geometries. And then lastly, 3D cutting, which would be like cutting the, the face area out of a, of a motorcycle helmet. Um, and that would be true 3D work. Most of our customers are asking for the bevel cutting and 2D work to be optimized. Well, when you get into these bevel and 3D applications, now you're getting into uh, a product that we call Flow Expert. It employs the dynamic water jet technology, but it does so in 3D. And so it is the Flow Expert software, which is a, an extension upon Flowmaster, and dynamic water jet XD, which is an extension upon the standard dynamic water jet that worked in 2D. So the intelligent controls in 3D uh, that, uh, is a very important aspect, and it's something that impacts shops greatly because, frankly, it's not that easy to program 3D parts in the shop. Flow Expert 2015 is the world's first fully integrated 3D modeling and water jet pathing software package. It expands on the 2D Flowmaster, but it, it, it allows you to import solid models or flat patterns either way and you can very quickly create, modify, and path 3D geometry all in one program. And this is the only water jet package that can do that. Now I don't have time in this webinar to do Flow Expert justice, so let me try to summarize it with eight quick facts, and hopefully this will then allow you to, to make some sense over what this product is all about. It is WaterJet's only solid model-based programming software. It's working directly with the native models, and this reduces programming errors. And if you're a programmer out there, then, then you understand that that is a great attribute. Fully integrated CAD CAM allows you to modify and path all files in a single program. Full direct modeling software allows even novice users to quickly create complex assemblies. So you can use this just to, to make models as well. Behind Flow Expert is SpaceClaim. We have a very tight partnership with, with SpaceClaim. And with that, we have been able to put our technologies together into one seamless system. And SpaceClaim is great model software if you're not uh, familiar with it already. Integrated sheet metal functionality automatically flattens complex sheet metal parts for processing on the water jet. So the K factors and such are, are, would be input, and then you can open up a box into a flat pattern and cut it on the water jet. Now, water jets are most often used on, on plate, which is thicker material, but it is also commonly used on sheet metal as well. And this function allows people to use it for boxes and, and such, which is, which is a, a very common need in the sheet metal industry. Automatic path checking finds collisions. 
um, it's basically smart. It's got all the knowledge of flow built into it, so it knows what to look for and it, and it can fix these things automatically. We've linked the path in the model. So this means that if you're going to change a geometry on that model in some minor way, you don't have to necessarily repath it. If the, if the change wasn't too significant, it allows you to very uh, quickly make a change to the model. The path is, is modified as well, and you're ready to cut the part. And that's very, very uh, time-saving. It has a guided workflow like a wizard that you'd have in, in Microsoft Word or something. There's a guided workflow that allows anyone to program complex parts. No 3D model experience is required. And so basically, it, it helps take you through the steps as you're using the software, every time you're using the software. This is very powerful. Um, if you have questions, as I mentioned, please ask the questions of the applications engineers. And if you're familiar at all with solid modeling, then I suggest that you uh, ask for a demonstration. In interviews with our customers, we found that some of our customers are using models now. Some of them receive models and have to redraw them as flat. And then other types know that models are coming. Bottom line is that all of the customers that we spoke to, uh, they all said that even if I'm not using models now, I know it's coming. And having help like this to be able to quickly, easily get into the solid arena really does uh, help them move their business forward. This brings us to the end of the webinar with the last section. We're going to compare the processes of plasma, laser, EDM, and water jet. So, so far we've talked about the water jet technology, how it's used, what it does, how it works, and then also about the latest advancements of hyperpressure and the intelligent CAD CAM uh, 3D modeling software. Now we're moving into a quick comparison of these technologies. I don't expect you to walk away with, with a complete understanding of all four of these. This is just going to be one slide and one slide only that has a lot of information on it. And I'm hoping that you'll walk away with a deeper understanding of how the water jet compares to these other technologies. And here is that slide. You can see across the top the processes of water jet plasma, laser, and EDM. And the water jet is a supersonic erosion process. Plasma, laser, and EDM all use heat of different types. The EDM is a spark. It's a, basically a lightning bolt uh, going from the wire over to the material. Laser is, of course, uh, heat coming off the laser beam. The plasma is a flame cutter, a burning. And the plasma in EDM will only cut electrically conductive material. The laser needs to cut material with the right thermal properties. The water jet is a supersonic erosion process. It will cut basically anything. Secondary processes. The water jet usually is none. I mentioned before that it gets a 100 to 125 RA uh, satin smooth finish to it. Um, usually there's no secondary operations. The plasma typically, yes, you usually have to grind off the, the heat affected zone for weld prep. Uh, lasers, um, sometimes yes, sometimes no. EDM, usually no. Materials, the water jet will cut anything. Plasma will cut electrically conductive material. Laser cuts materials that have the right thermal properties. EDM cuts electrically conductive. Bouncing back to the laser, the CO2 laser is um, one that has a bit of trouble with the aluminums and brass and copper because when those metals are in a molten state, they are a near perfect mirror. And so the CO2 laser struggles a bit with those, but they try to improve that with time, of course, as they battle that issue. The abrasive water jet is a supersonic erosion process. It'll cut basically anything. And I keep saying virtually anything, basically anything. There are some materials that it can't cut. For example, it can't cut diamond. Uh, the diamond is too much harder than the garnet is. That's, that is the abrasive that we're using, garnet sand. And um, it also can't cut tempered glass because when you uh, the tempered glass has a tremendous amount of stresses in it so that when you were to have an accident and break it, it's supposed to break into a million pieces. Well, when you cut tempered glass, you are relieving those stresses, and then it is designed to break into a million pieces. So those are a couple of examples. Uh, but the abrasive water jet is a very, very versatile process. Thickness, we can cut over 10 inches thick. We do have customers cutting 24 inches and more, saving weeks of machining on, on super alloys. Um, but usually on, with the water jet, you're cutting 3 to 4 inches for a precision part. So 
a thickness up to three to four inches you can cut to high precision. Beyond that, it's really a rough cutting process. Plasma is two to three inches. However, when you get to two to three inches thick, you're usually going to be using an oxyacetylene torch rather than a plasma. Most plasma tables are equipped with plasma and oxy on, on the same machine so that when they go to thicker materials, you jump over to the oxy. The laser um, is generally going to be uh, one inch or less. The bigger wattage lasers can go a little bit thicker. The EDM can cut very thick and very accurately. It will do so glacier slow. Part accuracy. Um, you can get a part down with dynamic water jet down to a thousandth of an inch tolerance. Uh, plasma is about 10. Laser is very accurate. EDM is extremely accurate. The rough cut of an EDM is a thou and a half, and the best cut on a water jet is about that range. Uh, most water jet cutting is going to be in the range of 3 to 10 thou, but with a good operator and dynamic water jet, you can get it down to plus or minus 1 thou. The capital investment, you can see there, the water jet uh, price much more like a plasma. Machine setup. I mentioned before that uh, much like a chainsaw, the water jet is used with the same set of parameters for all the materials that you cut, just changing cut speed. Well, um, the plasma, laser, and EDM, you would vary the setup to optimize the performance through different materials. You'd, uh, you would vary either uh, the wire type or the tension, or you'd vary the gases used, the assist gases, to blow away the, the material. Um, there's different things that you vary with plasma, laser, and EDM to optimize them for different materials, but not so with the water jet. When you think of machine setup, you might also think of fixed ring or holding the part in place. And in those cases, the, all of these are non-contact cutters. The, um, the, the machine itself doesn't touch it, shoots something out, and that thing that it shoots out is actually what touches the material. So the cutting forces of all of these are quite low. So that is an overall uh, viewpoint of how WaterJet compares in just one quick slide of plasma, laser, and EDM. And I'm hoping that that gives you some kind of idea of where they might fit. The WaterJet really is a complementary process. It complements these others. It, it doesn't uh, necessarily replace them. And uh, they work very well together in, uh, in expanding the capabilities of the manufacturing shops of the world. So that concludes our webinar. And today we've covered the water jet overview, common applications, and comparison to other technologies. And I truly hope this was of value to you. Please ask questions at the end here in just a moment. And also write us with any questions that you might have and we'll promptly respond. Thank you very much for your time today. What pressure is needed for different applications? For instance, if I need to cut uh, polymer, what, what equipment pressure and cost is needed compared to cutting steel or food products? Well, uh, depending on what type of polymer and the machinability of the material, uh, if it's a thinner type of polymer, you can actually get away with water-only cutting without using an abrasive. Uh, as far as equipment for cutting like polymer and then switching to food, you can run a water-only head for doing that. Now, for cutting steel, harder materials, you want to use an abrasive head for doing things like that. So. It'll take your high pressure water, mix it with abrasive, that way you can cut you know, your steel, aluminum, uh, harder materials that you couldn't cut with a knife blade, essentially. Yeah, and if it's, if it's one of those things that you're not sure if uh, you contact uh, you know, regional representative or contact flow, we're, ha we're happy to do test cuts for you on these things and determine what those speeds are and what the exact equipment you need is. Is there a material too thin for water jet? Um, generally, no. Uh, the, the thing with, that you run into with materials with water jet, uh, we'll, we might change abrasives uh, to you know change the edge finish uh, slightly. But uh, again, you know it's one of those things that you know doing sample cuts answers. Uh, you know a lot of that. But uh, you know when you get down to a material that's really thin, a lot of times it's just water only. So, uh, so far we haven't found anything of this too thin to cut. Are there different tips, heads, or any other hardware required to switch between steel and aluminum sheet? So, uh, both materials will require an abrasive water jet setup. 
which means that you don't have to do any type of tooling change at all. The only time that you may change, say, a nozzle and orifice combination would be if you wanted a smaller kerf, depending on the detail of the part that you needed to cut. What are some other applications where one would want to reduce the cutting pressure? Um, some materials like uh, glass and uh, stone, things like that, you may want to reduce cutting pressure. Uh, mostly because you're running like a finer mesh abrasive and you don't want to put as much stress on the material. So uh, sometimes we'll turn the pressure down a little bit, mostly when we're doing low pressure piercing. That's the only time that we really have to do that. Does the water need to be pre-treated? -treat, pre, uh, no. Uh, typically, the, the most we ever recommend is a, uh, you know, generally a water softener. Uh, but prior to the installation of any uh, flow system, uh, we do a water quality check at the site and make recommendations based on the uh, lab feedback. What size is the garnet? So. Standard garnet mesh sizes range from uh, 50 up to, we have customers that actually run 230 mesh. Uh, we've ran up to 320 before. Uh, it's just going to depend on what type of application you need. The industry standard for the most part is going to be 80 mesh, and that results in a pretty good edge quality along with pretty decent cutting speeds also. Uh, smaller the mesh size, Usually the slower the cutting, but the finer surface finish you'll end up with. Can you cut a B4C SIC material? Yes, uh, we've cut boron carbide. I actually did this a couple weeks ago. Uh, I've cut boron carbide and silicon carbide materials. Uh, usually you have to go with a different type of abrasive, like an aluminum oxide or even a silicon carbide abrasive. But yes, we cut those quite often. How often do you need to change out the nozzle? That, you know, that, that's one that, you know, kind of jumping off of uh, Matt's last, last question. I mean, you're going to get, <clears throat> you know, uh, life, life dependency is going to be based on the abrasive that you're using. So you're going to get, uh, you know, you know 300 to 500 hours on a nozzle. Um, if you use something like aluminum oxide, uh, it's going to go down quite a bit. Uh, silicon uh, carbide, uh, you know, e even less so. I mean, you can silicon carbide uh, at you know hyper pressure, you get maybe you know 10, 15 minutes out of a nozzle. So, uh, but generally, you're going to be you know in, in the hundreds of hours. Uh, it'll, a lot of it will depend on the quality of the nozzle as well. The uh, nozzle chips themselves are, there, there's a range of uh, materials that they'll make them in. So uh, that, that will also be uh, dependent on the uh, uh, life of them. We are experiencing problems with garnet flow due to moisture, humidity. Do you have any recommendations to avoid these types of clogs? Uh, air dryer. Um, it's one, one of those things that uh, garnet is very susceptible to uh, moisture coming from a compressor, and um, one of the recommendations always is that you need good dry air. Uh, so, you know, putting putting a good uh, quality air dryer on your system uh, will help from inducing that moisture into the into the tanks. Can a water jet be used to do 3D cutting, such as cutouts, notches? in tubing while not penetrating the other side of the tube? Yes. Um, it's one of those things that, uh, again, I'd recommend doing some test cuts, contacting our uh, sales department and arranging for uh, that test cutting. But, uh, yeah, we have a lot of applications where we're cutting through sidewall of tubing. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's not as simple as just throwing it up on the table. It does require a little bit of fixturing and uh, setup, uh, you know, design. But... Uh, yeah, we've got several customers in the aerospace industry doing exactly that. Is it quick or easy to transition between a setup for cutting aluminum and a setup for cutting plastic? 
Uh, yes, it is pretty quick. You can actually run the same exact setup. The only thing you would have to change is what type of material you're cutting in the uh, Flow Cut software as part of the Flow Master software suite, and tell it what thickness, and it'll generate the uh, code to do the cut. What is the downtime required to change out different abrasives? Generally, uh, if it's if you have two different hoppers sitting there, it's something that could be less than five minutes. If it's something where you've got to pump a hopper completely empty and add abrasive, then it's it's going to be a little bit longer. But most customers, if you if you have a situation where you're running multiple abrasives, they will have uh, generally their main bulk transfer hopper and then maybe uh, a couple of smaller portable hoppers. Or you know if they're doing it a lot, they might have two bulk transfer hoppers and it's just a matter of switching the lines at the uh, metering valve. What is the thinnest sheet metal that can be cut? Uh, the thinnest sheet metal I've ever cut was actually 7th thou thick. So, um, and that is not a standard size at all. So we can cut, as long as you can put it on the table and still see it, you could probably cut it as long as it's sheet metal. So. What is the smallest feature and what is the aspect ratio? The smallest feature is going to be really kind of dependent on the mixing tube and the garnet. Uh, you're cutting with a round tool, so if we cut with a uh, 20 thousandths mixing tube, for instance, you know, the, the inside feature radius that we can get is going to be you know, 10 to 12 thousandths. Uh, you can go down to a 15 thousandths mixing tube as standard, uh, you know, to get tight, tighter tolerances. And then there's there are custom tubes and custom applications that we've designed for customers as well uh, that get even tighter. But um, you know, generally, you know, with, with standard setups, you, it, you're kind of limited to your feature is going to be based on the mixing tube. Are other abrasives used besides garnet? Yeah, we actually use uh, a lot of different abrasives. We use everything from, uh, throughout the history of Waterjet, they've used everything from uh, sand, which is essentially crushed quartz, like you would find on a beach. But for the most part, we're going to use garnet. But then we also use uh, aluminum oxide abrasives, silicon carbide abrasives. And that's mostly what you're going to run into. We, we use garnet generally because it's it's got a much sharper edge and it's harder. Uh, you know, something like uh, we've got customers try to run beach sand, and it's it's soft. It doesn't uh, it doesn't cut nearly as well, and it's just not not very efficient either. So, does the water need to be pre-treated? No. Again, it's you know it's one of those things that we'll do a water test prior to the installation of a machine. Uh, but generally, in most cases, the most that we're ever going to recommend is a water softener. Is a lead-in required to start cutting an internal feature, and or can the water jet pierce accurately on the spot? You you would want a lead-in. Um, it, it, as it pierces through the material, um, there's t basically two way, ways to pierce. We can just do a stationary pierce where it erodes through the material, and generally it's going to be a slightly larger opening um, in that particular case as it pierces through. Or we do what we call, you know, kind of a pierce on the fly, where uh, the jet starts moving uh, before it, you know, gets through the material. And, th and this is key for thicker materials because uh, it allows us to pierce material much, much faster. How are the abrasives separated from the water after use? Are both the water and abrasive reusable, at, or are they waste? Um, that's uh, so. There is there's kind of two different questions there. So the the water you can have a closed loop system and and reuse the water. Um, you, it, it requires a, a you know series of filtration to get the water clean enough to reuse. Uh, the abrasive itself, uh, there are companies out there that make um, abrasive recyclers. Uh, it is expensive because uh, you're drying wet sand, but uh, there are companies that do it, and it's just depending on the ROI 
Uh, it's just whether or not it makes sense. And you know, getting with a uh, uh, flow rep, you know, they can certainly uh, take a look at the situation and make recommendations for you on that. What is the largest bed available for cutting large sheets? Um, man, uh, we have done all sorts of custom sizes, so I, you know, I, I can't say that uh, there is a size that we haven't come up with yet that is too large. So uh, generally, we've got, you know, uh, up to 14 meters. Yeah, four, 14 yeah. meter long. I think is the longest that I've seen installed recently. So. Here's another one. Um, we're asking if you can cut um, eight thou inch thick nickel. Is it possible to cut that with high precision at plus or minus one thou of an inch uh, position tolerance? Yes, uh, I have done that before. I've actually gotten to within half a thou repeatedly. Uh, as long as fixturing is set up correctly, you know, making sure your part doesn't move and anything like that. Uh, now, once your parameters are set, it's repeatable every time. What is the kerf size? So kerf sizes are going to range, uh, they're usually going to depend on the size you're mixing to. Uh, for water only, it'll actually depend on the size of the orifice. So we have kerf sizes for water only go from 3 thou up to 10 thou, 13 thou, something like that. And uh, for abrasive cutting, we have everything that runs from about 15 thou up to 50 thou, you can. We do have that option. Uh, so it's just going to depend on what your application needs. What is the smallest holes that you can cut? Special applications, we've done, uh, I'm trying to think here, we've probably done holes in the uh, 10 thou and under range uh, with our advanced applications group. Uh, again, standard, you know, just throwing a standard combination that you would use at a just a regular job shop. You're, you're going to be in that anywhere from that 15 thousandths range on up. But uh, our advanced applications group, if that's if there's an application there and, uh, that you need, our, our group over there will certainly look at it and uh, has got a lot of experience in developing those those custom uh, applications for water jet. How are parts kept in sheet, micro joints? If so, what size? So what we do with that is uh, we actually create what we call tabs. It's a feature that you can do in the programming software. So if you're cutting small, intricate parts that are going to fall through the slats into the catcher tank, uh, you can actually add little tabs so that you, after you cut all your parts out, lift the sheet up, and you just snap them off. And then if you needed to, you could just like buff the uh, tab marks off. And usually tab size is going to be about 50, 60 thou, somewhere around there. How do you account for the waviness of a sheet of aluminum? Well, we have a couple of different accessories that will go on, a water, on our water jet systems. Uh, we have one accessory that's called dynamic contour follower, which will actually help elevate your Z as it's going along cutting a part out. Uh, we also have another option that's called our DynaBeam laser height setter. So uh, that can actually go through, uh, measure standoff every time you do a pierce or when you're cutting a part, and then it'll be able to make sure that you're maintaining that 100,000 standoff or whatever standoff you're usually running. What kind of maintenance is required and waste treatment or safety issues? Uh, maintenance required is going to be basically your preventive maintenance on the pumps uh, and the cutting heads. I mean, you've got consumables, you've got orifice mixing tubes, you know, brace of that are your consumables. Uh, your slats over time will be a consumable. Uh, and then you've got, you know, basically the, the maintenance, much like you would have on a car that you've, you've got to do. So you've got to, you know, change filters and, uh, you know, look, look at things like that in terms of the operation of the pump. Uh, in terms of uh, wastewater filtration, things like that, there's a lot of it's going to depend on the municipality. 
Uh, we offer uh, filtration systems uh, and garnet removal, uh, you know, systems to keep uh, sedimentation from going, you know, down the drain. But uh, generally, it's it's kind of based on the municipality. So if uh, you, you know, if you're if you're cutting heavy metals, generally you're not going to just run that water straight to drain. Uh, you're going to have to contain that and and hold it in, in kind of a closed system. But if you're just cutting standard materials, aluminum, steel, things like that, the water generally can go uh, just through a fil you know, through a filtration system and straight to drain with, without any issues. But uh, yeah, if, there, if there's a question or you're concerned, I would say you know check check with your local m municipality and see if they have any uh, specific restrictions. Can small parts be easily caught without tabs? They actually can. Um, so what you would want to do is use a sacrificial material, some type of a backing. So we have a product that we call a water jet brick, and it's like a uh, corrugated plastic that you can put your material on top of, and you can cut your small intricate parts, and it will actually keep it from falling through. You can actually do multiple cuts over the same area on that water jet brick before it's just totally wasted away and you have to replace it. What is the typical abrasive usage for aluminum sheet thin, and how is the abrasive stored and fed into the machine? So typical abrasive usage for, we'll say, 8th inch aluminum, it's all going to depend on what combination you have set up and what type of pump. So if we're running a you know, 100 horse hyperjet, we're going to be running probably 1.2 pounds of abrasive a minute, and uh, running at 87,000 psi with a 15,000 orifice, 40,000 mixing tube. So our cut speed is going to be pretty quick, depending on you know size of the part and all that stuff. So uh, for aluminum sheet, your abrasive usage is going to be pretty small, and it's going to all depend on you know what you're cutting too, like how big the part is and all that. As far as abrasive storage, so we have a pressurized hopper that the abrasive goes in. We have multiple sizes, everything from 100 pound up to 2,200 pound, I believe. And uh, all it is is just an air pressurized uh, vessel that pushes the abrasive up to the cutting head, and then it's just gravity fed into the uh, actual mixing chamber there. Unfortunately, our time is almost up. All answered questions will be passed along to Flow International, and you can expect a reply via email. Sorry again for the video issue at the end. This entire presentation, with the conclusion, will be available this afternoon and can be accessed using the same sign-in link you used to join us for the live presentation. Water jet machining technologies have greatly improved in recent years with high precision cutting of a wide range of materials used in manufacturing operations. Advanced Manufacturing Media's parent organization, SME, has been involved with this innovative and developing technology for decades. Water jet technology will be featured in the November issue of Manufacturing Engineering Magazine and look for the latest developments in water jet machining technologies at upcoming SME events, including West Tech from September 15th to 17th in Los Angeles, South Tech October 27th through 29th in Charlotte, North Carolina. Thanks for joining us today. We hope you found the presentation informative.